Welcome. We are in week five, if you can believe it. Alrighty, one more to go. So this was on the original schedule for week four, what we're doing today, but it's week five now. So Sacred Seals, Science of Mudras, The Heart and Universe Express. So we're going to deepen in our experience and understanding of mudras. Um, from the Nacha Shastra for our Odissi purposes. Um, but Sarsa had a great question last time in regards to how do we embody when we're dancing? And that is um, a practice that takes many years. I'm, I'm going to guess for most people it's going to take many years. Um, but that's where we're going to start today is I'm just going to share a bit about that. Um, we can have a discussion and then we'll move into mudras. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you this wonderful video of an Odissi dancer. So don't watch it now, but um, when I was thinking about what I was going to share today, I haven't seen this video in years and this is this popped up. So <clears throat> when you watch this video, it's of a man doing Odissi dance, a young man, and he's doing a Kali choreography, which those are rare. I've actually never seen one live that I can think of. This is the only Kali choreography I've actually ever seen. Um, hello, Potion. And uh, when you watch, this video, here's the video again, boom. So just take that and enjoy it another time. But when you watch this video, you'll see that he morphs into the deity. And you see that he has just, like there is nothing else going on in his reality than the dance, and then embodying that deity. Hi, Mia, and your little Mia there. Awesome. <laughs> um, welcome. So part, just I'm, I'm using this video as a segue that you'll get to enjoy at the, at the right time. But um, so when you watch this video, he is with this laser-like, pristine focus on what he's doing both the dance so the highly technical dance which is flawless and there's no shaking at least apparently when you watch it there's no tremor in his body mind or energy that he is anything other than the deity and you see it in his eyes. You see it in his body doing like unfathomable things. Um, and you feel it. Like I, I cry every time I see this piece. So that is a great way to segue into what we're gonna talk about today um, before we get into mudras, which is embodying the deity while we do dance. And so, um, that is what makes the journey of Temple Tribal Fusion so unique to any other tribal fusion or belly dance or even any other performance dance, meaning dances that are created for others to see um, in, in the modern context. So Balinese dance, <clears throat> ancient traditional dance, it's a temple dance, which other people see, so I guess you could call it a performance, and now they do have performances and shows. But again, just like Odissi, those Balinese dancers are totally psychedelic in some other realm, and they take you there. Um, I remember the first time I actually 
received this incredible opportunity to be the costumer for a Balinese fusion dance company based in the East Bay, California, East Bay, San Francisco. Um, and so they, they, I got to see my first Balinese performance with them. And then I, they sent me to Bali to do the costumes and I got, to, I, yeah, it's a whole crazy story, but I got to seat myself in it. I actually got to study with like the main dance teacher there. She took me into her home. I stayed with her. I mean, I was so outrageous. Um, but anyway, I got to experience the dancers completely go into another realm and they completely embody the deity. Now for the true Balinese temple dancer, they've got the advantage. One, they're in a tradition that is deeply integrated with the spirit realm. The whole human waking, the whole human life is about being integrated with the spirit realm. There's offerings be made all day long, temples are active, that kind of thing. Um, but the dancers, so the dancers start very young, just like in Odissi and um, the original temple dances from India. <clears throat> they start, so I'm talking Balinese now because there are variations, um, but there's consistencies as well. So. Uh, they start very young, like when the bones are still shaping, so four or five, six years old, sometimes even earlier. Um, and that, so this is what I've been told. And then in the traditional Balinese temple dancing, and then uh, there would be a certain auspicious day of the year and a, at a certain auspicious temple with those who run the temple, the priests or whomever. And the dance teachers would send the specific students that they thought had the specific capacity to do dance transmission deity embodiment. So then they would, all these different dancers would collect at the temple with the teachers and the priests and whomever else were viewing to determine who would be the temple dancers and then the music would start and the dance would begin and it would be clear who the true embodied, like most capable for embodying the deity and getting out of the way, getting the body being ego out of way. And then they would pluck those to be the specific temple dancers of the temple and then train them on that specific track. Um, so there are just personalities karma you know there's certain people who are just more designed have more of an aptitude for this their personality type just the same as with performers you know all of the the most high-ranking performers i know have huge egos they'll even tell you i'm a total egomaniac i mean most of the biggest names in dance um whom i have personal relationships they'll tell you i'm an egomaniac um, there's Leos, there's Sagittarius's, they're big personalities um, that let them just own a stage and have that kind of ego that, that owns a stage. Um, the temple dance per personality is at the opposite end of the spectrum. Super humble, doesn't need anyone to see them. Like, uh, it's just a very different, it's a prayer. It's not a show. So it's a very different thing. So then here we are in this container of Temple Tribal Fusion, which is taking these two extremes and putting them together. Okay, it's not easy. And anyone who's watching this video, I don't expect everyone to do this. In fact, I'll be shocked if a lot of people, one, are interested, and two, journey down the path to three, actually do it. Um, I'm not asking anyone to do it. I'm not expecting anyone to do it. Of course, I'm super stoked if there are those of you who want to do it, because those of you will be in my dance company. Um, and those of you who are on this super deep intensive study, 
as we are in this six week temple arts immersion, that is um, one of the first steps in actually getting to the word perform is not accurate, but it's just the easiest thing to say to perform together, um, to do trans dance transmission together. So any, I'm going to go a little backwards in time and my personal to catch you up to where we are now, but any questions with any of that, that I've said those thus far questions or comments before we move forward. If you do feel free to unmute you. All right, so I think it's important. Like I just didn't come out of my mom's womb temple dancing. <laughs> I just didn't like show up on the planet being like, yeah, I'm gonna embody the deity with tribal belly dance and temple dance and put it all together and do something with it. Not even. So, um, it's kind of loud out there. Close that. So, um, I was shoved through the public school system. No one once in my entire upbringing asked what my needs were. I was a total zombie. I wanted to die, but I wasn't going to do that to my parents. So I kept my body alive and I checked out. Um, and that's how I lived for decades. And, um, so by the time I was shoved through college doing something completely not in alignment with my heart and soul and reason for being here. I mean, however, apparently everything happens for a reason we're told. Um, but by the time I got out of college, I was really messed up. I was really, really messed up. Um, and so I graduated in San Francisco and, um, what year? Anyway, the house scene in San, I moved to San Francisco in 91 and the underground house scene had just started exploding and went through 2000 about. Um, and it was undescribable, the magic, the music, the dance opportunity, um, seven nights a week, you could have the best dance party of your life, literally. So I lived in the hotbed of that. I became deeply integrated in some of that. Um, I was one of the only women in the world doing a uh, live video projection mixing. Um, so I had kind of a royalty status in the underground scene and I got to dance and dance and dance and dance and dance saved my life. Um, the underground house scene saved my life. So I got to experience and start opening this body through dance. And somehow I found yoga as well. Now the only yoga we had in San Francisco that early in the nineties was Bikram. There was one Bikram studio way on one end of town and then a Shivananda ashram in another part of town. And the Shivananda teacher was this big fat guy that I don't even think he did any asana. He, it was horrible. So anyway, I went to big room. <laughs> so that was my awakening was the underground house scene and some yoga. Um, and then eventually this weird thing happened where people kept coming up to me like random strangers. Oh, are you a dancer? What kind of dance do you do? And I'd be like, so finally I realized it was the universe or whatever, my angel saying, you got to study dance. So I was like, and I think I told this story recently. Um, so, but it's going in a different direction. So anyway, I was like, okay, well, and this was before internet. So I just opened the phone book and I was like, well, I think belly dance is what I want to do. That's probably what I'm most likely doing when I'm on the dance floor. Um, so I just went for the biggest ad in the paper because I figured if you're paying for an ad, you got some clout. So it was fat chance belly dance. So I was like, cool, I'll go and do this fat chance belly dance thing. So I did that for years um, with Carolina Noricchio, 
And it turns out that she created a style um, American tribal ATS, American tribal style belly dance, um, which has now completely gone like wildfire fire around the entire planet. Um, so she seeded in me these ancient dances of the feminine that she bridged into her style of fat chants. So anyway, I went on that tribal belly dance track. I was with her group when I first performed at the Tribal Fest in Sebastopol, like, God, how many years ago? 2001 or two, th no, that must have been like 99. Anyway, long time ago, terrifying. I was backstage with these performer girls and I was like, whoa, I don't think this is my world. And then I got on stage, I was like, hmm. And I did Tribal Fest. I was one of the original small crew. It was very small when we started that. Did it every year, sold my clothes. Was, and I just, as I saw it build and I saw the egos gathering and I felt more and more like <laughs> um, from those kind of egos and catty and just really not nice people, not speaking all of them, but a large majority of them. I just started realizing I'm like, and at that point I had really been dedicated to my dance, but I was like, this doesn't feel right to me. But I just continued along the track because there were no other options that I had seen. And there was a venue um, in San Francisco, which street? I think on Valencia. Um, every big name in tribal belly dance that you've ever heard of that came out of, so but tribal belly dance was created in the 90s in San Francisco. And I believe Carolina Marikia was the first one to use the term tribal. And then all of us gals from, um, so tribal belly dance really was created and was and magnetized women like myself. There was the house scene going on, so there was electronic music. I lived in the hood for 10 years. The projects were across the street. I was the only one in my building that didn't get mugged. Um, I was in the hood. Um, so it was like, it was the edgy girls, like Karen Mulricchio. She was probably the first woman in belly dance to be covered in tattoos. She was mountain, uh, motorcycle, dyke. I mean, you know, it was these really like true gypsies. Like when you travel anywhere in the world, when you see the gypsies, they're the low caste. They're not afraid. They're hustling. They're doing whatever they can to just survive and they don't have to abide by rules because they're so low caste they don't have rules so anyway we were just like that we were like just edgy gypsies in the san francisco underground so that's where tribal belly dance came from and then there was a certain track you go and perform at this hookah bar place in san francisco <clears throat> Um, name any of the big names you know from San Francisco, they've performed there. And so I was like, well, I guess that's what I do. So I did that and <clears throat> I had the month booked or two months, whatever. I did the first night and I was like, hmm, okay, that was all right, but that was not great. But I was booked for a whole, like I had a whole bunch of weeks booked, so I couldn't back out. So the next time I went, and I don't, this is a whole nother story. I don't know how I found Kali um, or how I found Tara. Probably my trips to India. Different story, not this one. But I, this time, so trip number two, show number two, and these are solo shows. <laughs> I'm on stage by myself. I can't hide behind any other dancers. And it's a very intimate, the audience is right there. Oh yeah, so that first one, okay, so I have to go back here. So the first one, the first show, I just did what I thought I was supposed to do and what I've seen all the other dancers doing. And I felt like I was a prostitute on the stage. The energy was not the kind of exchange that I wanted to have. Now other dancers might be totally fine with that. 
Um, but that was not what I want. I was having this like, look at me. I'm the sensual seductress. Look at all my cool tricks that I can do. I'm going to seduce you and we're going to have the sexual exchange experience. And that's what I had. And I left and I was like, oh my God, gross, yuck. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have that kind of exchange with my audience. I, no. So I was kind of like flipped out. What am I going to do? I'm booked for a whole bunch of shows. So the next time I went with my Kali and my Tara and I'm backstage and I put them out and I was like, I can't do this. I'll go out there, but I'm giving my body up to you and I'm counting on you to do this dance. I'm counting on you to take over and use my body and do something far more significant than performance. And so I went out, now granted, this was not choreography, this was improv, so it's a lot easier when you do improv. But so I went out there for the very first time with this motivation and dedication, and I went out there and I did my best to keep my mind out of the way and keep on saying, just, you're doing the dance. Here's my body take me over, dance for, a, for these people in a way that it actually serves them. And I just had to keep navigating the mind and in, in would come those thoughts of, oh my God, what the fuck am I doing? Oh my God, I must look like a total fool. Oh, da, da, you know, all those like discursive thoughts diving. And I would have to just super quickly navigate and slay those whoosh, going back to like, just take me over. You know, I'm yours, like embody this dance. And then the other chatter would come in of like, oh, look at this cool trick and da 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 da. Oh, I'm so beautiful and all this like inflated ego stuff. And I'd have to, again, super quickly, full on Dakini work, like slay, cut, chit, that, that out of the way. So it was this constant like mind wrangling. At the same time that I'm doing complex technique, I'm in front of people by myself on center stage. I mean, it was like so many elements navigating, but that was the beginning of it. And after that performance, people were coming up to me and we were having these really beautiful, sincere connections. And they're like, oh my gosh, I've been coming here for years. I've never seen a dancer do that. What were you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't know. And I felt, I felt good. I felt good about the dance. I felt good about my personal experience. I felt good about what I had given the audience. I felt great about what the audience was giving me, both during the dance when it was just an energetic exchange and then the verbal um, feedback afterwards. So I knew I had struck my way. I knew I had, I was at the trailhead of something that I had no idea where it was going to take me, but I knew I could come back every week and perform there and feel good about it. So that was the beginning. Um, long, long time ago now. Questions or comments before I finish this story? I have a question. Yeah. When did you start teaching? I'm just kind of curious where that... I think you were in my first classes. Yeah. Where was it like 2005? Um, that's what I was trying to remember. Is it, was it in 2005? Was that late? Um... I think it was at that studio in Fairfax, right? Yes. I think those were my first classes. I'm not really sure, but I think they might have been. 2003? So where were you in that, in that timeline, though? How okay, yeah, so that, that venue, I'm thinking, was... I moved out of San Francisco in 2001. 
I'm not sure if I was still in the city or not. Yeah, I think I was. So it must have been like 2000 or 2001 that I was performing there. Yeah, it took me a while to get the gumption to teach. And even then, that was a train wreck for years. <laughs> it took a while to learn to teach. Any more questions or feedback comments? I think I'm just really appreciative of you sharing your story because um, I can really resonate and especially in this crazy, crazy time, it's like I can only do so much sitting practice and really like the only thing, it's hard not to get emotional about it, has been dance, dancing. So I totally get it. So thank you. Yeah, and this is part of why I had to leave Tibetan Buddhism for about two years or more, plus or minus two years, is I was like, it feels like a masculine, um, it, it just felt so patriarchically dominated and it's like everything from here and above. There's nothing uh, integrated in the practice from here and below. So I, even now, and I won't say this in, to anyone in my Sangha, but even now, when I look around my Sangha, and we're all sitting there hours and hours, days and days, they're not physically healthy looking people. They're not really embodied down here. They don't have the Vajra attributes of a Dakini or a Heruka. It's all here. It's all conceptualization. So for me, you know, and those of us who are really taking this, these paths of the yogini seriously, whether you do the yogini of the Indian tradition or the yogini of the Tibetan tradition, which we call Dakini, um, you gotta have, I, I think you have to have the physical practice. Now, of course, um, in the Tibetan tradition, we're doing prostrations, but that is, I don't think that's enough alone. I think that because that can be really hard on the body. I've had to take a break from prostrations due to my shoulders and my knees. Um, but yeah, something more integrated. Um, I, I know there are Tibetan yogas, like uh, I, don't, I, I don't know much about those, but, and those aren't taught. I mean, I haven't been taught those in any of my years of Vajrayana. So um, I know Namkai Norbu had that integrated in his teachings. Maybe Jacqueline can share that with us sometime. That would be awesome. Um, so, yeah. Tibetan yoga is kind of similar to Ayurvedic. Um, like there's pranayama and there's, um, it's not as physically demanding as um, the kind of yoga that like you're teaching in your classes, for example. It's, it's similar to Qigong in the sense that you're doing not, um, you're moving not, not, uh, Nadia, not, Nadia, yeah. Nadis. Nadis, you're moving Nadis and, um, yeah. It's cool. Yeah. Anyway, it'd be interesting to do some time. Um, so just to kind of close that story. So that was where it began. And let's see. Um, Sonam's asking me some questions. Do any Tara Akali practices? No, I didn't do any practice. I just prayed. Doing any Yeah, I was just praying. I didn't do practice. In fact, I didn't. I didn't have any practices then. This was before I had Yogini or Dakini teachers. Um, this was way very early on. So um, let me just think where I wanted to take this. Okay. So that's the basic concept to answer how do we do the deity embodiment dance transmission. So there's, there's in regards to, so let's just use the choreography that we're working on on Wednesdays in this series. So we are doing a highly technical choreography dance. We are planning on literally bringing in the Kali Yogini energies, presence, and the Dakini Yogini energy and presence. So just right there, there's a lot to take on. 
uh, the choreography, understanding the, these energies, how they work, their intentions, understanding their bhava, their emotions, their moods. So right there, we have a lot on the plate that we need to study the choreography and these deities. And as you know, what studying the choreography means there's all this like yoga and discipline and strength, agility, mind training. So that's just for the dance choreography. Then for the deities, there, I mean, those are two full, complete, complex lineages that I'm trying to give you in really potent, bite-sized, um, digestible, fast path chunks. So there's our study. But then, then how do we actually embody these energies, which is a total discipline in itself. So my understanding and practice is the more clean we can keep our body, mind, and energy, the more pristine and appropriate vessel we are for these deity energies. So that means it's really a lifestyle. It's like, what are you doing when you wake up throughout your day? How do you close your day? How are you sleeping? Like it's kind of a whole lifestyle. And that is actually what my full intention of Temple Tribal Fusion is, is that I will hold your hand to help you establish a lifestyle of deity embodiment, even if you don't ever dance. It's more just like, how do we stay in this high vibration centered place, having our yogini dakini lenses on, seeing the world, and being able to be clear enough to hear their wisdom guidance, to, to live their wisdom. So that is just a lifestyle in itself. So we have these two different parts of Temple Tribal Fusion, my teachings. One is the dance and yogas. Um, two is the lineages of yogini. And then over here is the option of um, how do we integrate the yogini into lifestyle. So there's lifestyle and there's dance. And in the middle is, are these traditions. Now, if you want, you can put them all together. Very complex training because you've got to have that choreography dialed so you're not being like, oh, was that chest light over here or was it over here? Oh, and I'm trying to embody the deity and be empty and complete mind, <laughs> laser mind, you know. It's, there's so many things going on. So we first have to get the choreography dialed to be able to go into emptiness and let go and focus on where's the mind? Because it's going to chatter. It's going to be going back and forth from like, oh my God, I must look like a total fool or my foot's in the wrong place or, you know, blah, blah, blah to, oh my God, look at how amazing I am. I'm total seductress. All my power I'm going to use over you. Like all, and I'm making this shit up, but you know, it's these extremes of the inflated ego and the deflated ego that are going to come and try to take you out of that space of transmission. So then once we can keep that space of clear mind, the deity comes in, the energies come in, you are blazing full presence, 100% union yoga. And then the energy of these, these energies come through and that's the transmission. And then they do whatever they're going to do. And then you have an audience who's frozen in time, their eyes are like this, and they have, they're having an experience. They're having a complete experience of their union, of their non-dual union, of time melting. And then they come back afterwards weeping, and they're like, what were you doing? So it's totally possible. I know any of you here have the capacity to do this. I can't say every single person that studies with me does or will, but I know 
I, I, from the little bits and from the lots bits to some of you here, um, that I know, I feel that you all have the capacity to do this. And the other women who are currently enrolled, who are gonna watch this later, I also know that you have the capacity to do this. Um, it's not an overnight project, it's years. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's not always easy, but I will say when you're on stage with a bunch of ladies doing it, it's way easier and it's way more powerful. Um, when you're alone on stage, holding all that by yourself, it, it's, you know, it's a bit different. So that is the story up to now. And I'm going to stop. So questions, comments. How about everyone's going to do something? So I'm going to just call on you. So Natalia, you're first, actually. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm curious, so Kali's a really big deity to embody, you know, she's like, as, as like a first starter, she's like, okay, that's, that's, that's intense. I'm wondering about embodying maybe like Saraswati or Lakshmi as deities, like said so the other aspects, the preserving or the creative force, because I guess I see them as a little bit less scary. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Sure. If I mean, sure. If you want to take these things home, so this is opening a great uh, suggestion, home practice for you ladies. Turn on your favorite music, set a sacred space, feel free to choose an auspicious day. Um, nights are optimum, um, but not limited, you know, depending actually, yeah, don't, I scratch that. Um, but yeah, get your favorite music, you know, set a, sp a sacred space, however you do with that, and explore this, like just improv mm -hmm. Explore this, and if, if you want to, you know, focus on, if you want to focus on a specific deity, great. There's also not having to focus on a specific deity, and more just feeling that divine energy, or like your higher self, or your egoless you so the stainless egoless you all of us have buddha nature within us um but we're in human bodies so we have our karmas and some scars and all that we're having our human experience um but explore use your dance uh improv music to explore finding that buddha nature and letting that be your full presence okay like that yeah, and so, and if you ladies do that, put it, um, we will, Natalia, we will get that Yogini page going. Promise. Uh, but put it on the Mandir or um, that Mandir, maybe the Mandir, the Mandir page for now. Um, if you feel like sharing. That would be awesome. So, um, that was a great question, Natalia. Any more with that? Awesome. Report back. <laughs> Sarsa, you're next in line on this. So ladies, say whatever's up for you, any questions? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about questions right now. And just, I guess I'm just sort of personally reflecting because uh, these last several months I've gained like a lot of clarity as far as this is like the direction that I want to go and then also experiencing like all these obstacles trying to like throw me off my path. So it's just kind of interesting <laughs> right now and wanting to renew my intentions and whatnot. So yeah, I guess I'm kind of thinking about that. And then also I post, I don't remember which Facebook page I posted on, but I, wore my Shakti adornments for the last month straight and I just finished my moon cycle and I didn't have any, I barely had any discomfort or cramps and I always do. So I don't know, like I'm going to keep exploring with that, but I thought that was like really interesting. So I thought I'd throw it out there. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I would guess that there's a link there with the moon cycle. Yeah. Um, in regards to the obstacles, you know, 
and I'm sure you've heard Sarsa, you've heard it from your Sangha, but um, so <laughs> I was about to go on really beautiful, intense Dakini retreat. And I'm packing to go on my retreat. I leave the next day and I about break my nose. And I have a call with my yogini teacher like 10 minutes after I about break my nose. So I'm, <laughs> and I'm not gonna lose an appointment with her because it's so rare we get to talk. So I'm laying on the bed with a bag of frozen berries on my face and I'm talking to her and she's like, how are you doing? You're about to go on retreat, right? I was like, yeah, I about broke my nose and I'm laying here with berries and it's getting black nose. She's like, oh, rejoice. That's so wonderful. That's such a great sign. The karma is, um, the karma is exploding. Oh, that's really a great sign. You're right on the path. Your practice is working. Have you heard this, Sarsa, <laughs> about obstacles? I do. I do think I have, but I like definitely tend to forget. And like right now, I have a broken pinky. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, it's a good reminder. <laughs> yeah, the broken nose, the broken pinky. Anyway, she's good at reminding me that the obstacles are signs that our practice is popping. Karma is clearing. Yeah, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to forget, but just the same about the obstacles. So as, as we say in Vajrayana, keep going. <laughs> Potion, how about you? What's going on for you? Um, yeah, I just, I think it's really fun to hear your journey and um, to try and like piece together, like when I started like when I met you and where you were at in your journey and kind of what, um, it's been fun to, to be on the ride with you and see your teachings evolve and your offerings evolve over the years too. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of your clothes that you were making back then and it's fun. Wow. Um, <laughs> tell you. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I, I can definitely resonate with improv being way easier to channel, right? I, I feel that way, definitely. I love, um, definitely love just dancing to music and, and then being, letting my body move. And then it integrate, integrates all the different dance styles that I've been learning. And you, and you do that, and then your body just takes it and melts it and turns it into something that feels like, um, like very healing it just feels like it's all for me like to me it's more like a self-healing process where my body's like oh it's something stuck in there and so I need to like shimmy that out or rotate that out or um you know snake arm that from the fingertips so I love doing that and so I actually got yeah, this nice um, comparison to trying to do a choreography thing where I'm just not as into it. I'm not, I can't get myself to practice it. I don't like, it's just not doing it. Like that's not what my body wants to do like that kind of a thing. So I think that's, um, an interesting edge. Maybe I could look at like why, um, what would it be like to just do it anyways and see what happens. Um, yeah. And, um, and if I might, I just want to share, like, I've been enjoying hearing everyone else sharing their experiences. And um, I, uh, so Tenley and I went to an energy school, too, at some point during this, this these years journey together. Um, and where you just learn to move your energy in different ways. I see some of it integrated in what you're teaching now. But um, I don't know if you ever had um, our teacher, Dana, tell, tell you this, but when we'd have our, our classes like once a week, um, we'd go in in the evenings. And if you ever had, uh, this is what he would say, like if you ever felt like you didn't want to come to class that night, like all of a sudden you're just like feeling really blocked and you don't want to go, you're feeling really strong resistance. He's like, that's when you need to come to class. Like when you have the strongest resistance is because you're about to pop something, like something's up and you're, and, and you're you know, you're, ego is like, oh, I'm not ready for that. Oh, I don't want to let that go. So 
um, anyways, I like um, <clears throat> hearing your your um, Bajra yoga, yoga teacher bring it into that other dimension of reality too. It's fun. That's right. I forgot about Dana saying that. Yeah, he, I remember they called it gross spurts, not growth spurts, but gross, because sometimes it just got gross when you're growing and you hit things. You said something, um, though, about um, doing the dance and it, it meeting your edge, and that's, that's such a great way to describe this with, the, with what I've been talking about, is we keep on hitting our edge. Like, it's very edgy. And then our edge gets expanded and expanded. And so we have capacity to do more, whether it's opening in the choreography, experiencing more of the divine energy or what have you. But um, yeah, and I think the best way to start with this is the improv, for sure, for sure. That's where, I mean, that's largely where, like I said, the underground house scene totally saved me. And I had it. And I'm sure most of you have had ecstatic divine experiences on the dance floor. How many of you have had a, a divine experience on a dance floor? When you're feeling like superhuman. Yeah. So great. You've already done it. So you know you can do it. Now we're just actually wanting to do it on demand. So, yeah. Um, thank you, Potion. Uh, Mia, do you have anything you want to share about this? And then Sonam, you're... Next. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, so, well, I'm just, the dance has always been like, sort of, one of the most straight connections with a sort of divine for me. And I've sort of, in my dancing, I've been doing these sort of, Mudras, sort of, uh, I mean, just like my body doing them. I don't know. I, I've never known what they are, <laughs> like, but my body has been moving in this sort of. So it's it's just. I'm so so grateful to like now have an actual, like, to learn what it actually is that my sort of body remembers, I guess, from some other <laughs> time, or I don't know, but it's like I'm sort of remembering all of these <laughs> things. So I'm, yeah, very, very precious to be sort of on this path. <laughs> um, and, uh, So do you have like in your daily practice a way, like a practice of like becoming the transmission or like like a mantra or like something that sort of keeps you sort of connected to the deity, uh, like that you can sort of daily practice to sort of... Hmm. Hmm. Uh, like, to stay so already like plugged in and then so you're so in then in in the daily practice it's sort of natural to just sort of be and then bring it into the dance hmm okay so I'm going to answer that question in a moment but I first want to just say Thank you for sharing that you feel like you have this in you. Um, I call that the codes. So some of, um, some of us actually are carrying these temple dance codes or yogini codes or both of these codes. And I have women, um, you know, not a lot, but occasionally women like you show up in the temple here and, um, they they tell me it's like something's waking up that I have in me. Um, I had a really beautiful visit with one of the new sisters. Um, a couple I don't know last. Year. Um, actually, she had a whole, like her codes came on and her body was doing stuff she's never done before. So, 
our memory practices the body and we come in here on a journey like we're doing here you see that temples that's the transmission that can awaken things you do these ancient dance moves that's also the transmission that can awaken do these mudras and all the stuff that we're doing, all of these things can literally activate and turn on your codes. These are like keys. I'm giving you secret ancient keys. And if you already carry the codes and the, the systems in your then here you go. There's a key. Boom, click. And you're like, boing. Oh my God. I already know how to do it. <laughs> so, um, I love hearing that you're one of those ladies. It's just so affirming for everything that we're doing here together. Um, so this is really interesting. Your question about do I have, like, yeah, I do have practices, but they're extremely complex, and I've been doing them with my teachers for countless years now. But this is a really interesting idea of something that I could give you ladies that you can do now, you don't need any complex background or previous whatever. Um, let me just feel into that really briefly. Well, um, I forgot, did you, did you enroll in what was called the daily discipline sadhana that we just did for four weeks? Yeah. Okay. yeah so so, I'm doing that. Okay, great. So I would say keep doing those, and they're intended to be repeated. Yeah, yeah. yeah because um, what, what are created for is to open, um, to strengthen, and to tune. So and that, I started very beginning foundational level. So. Yeah. Do another round of those because I'm getting a lot of good feedback on this. And um, I would love to be reminded or to. I think that's. Mama, you need to have that. I'm gonna write this down. Oh, that's a great idea. So we'll add that in the next series of four. Thank you. Um, anything else before we move on to Sonam? Anything else? Okay. All right. Um, Ms. Sonam, so any yes. questions? feedback that you might have on everything we've talked about well, i want to share a, uh, my experience of what you're talking about in 2010 i was in japan with a group of women tar dancers japanese and australian and there were two of us american women and we were dancing for the first time in a hundred years at isei the largest um, goddess, sun goddess site in the world of Shinto. So, and I've been doing Tara dance for 10 years up until that point. And um, my praise was Tara in her aspect as protector, right? And Felicity from Australia was leading us and we were on this stage, you know, and here are all these uh, Japanese sutric monks in the local community of Issei. And as we're dancing, it's pouring rain, which is a blessing from the sun goddess. And all of a sudden Felicity's dancing and she comes in and each of us get birth as a Tara aspect, a divine feminine aspect. And Felicity comes, I'm the first one out after her and she tells me her costume blew open. And there was, you know, here they're flashing all these sutric monks and everything. 
and I just kind of froze and thought that I was just, my personality, my consciousness was basically taken over and embodied by Tara and had uh, Mr. Hara, one of my Shinto teachers, not filmed it, I would have thought I was just there in one frozen pose. But instead, it was like the goddess moved me. Now, I don't know if it was the years of practice, past life, the codes that you're talking about, which I'm sure had something to do with it. Um, but that's when I experienced, and in this sacred site, like you go all over the India, that something triggered all the above so that the goddess was dancing me, embodied in this physical form. And so I kind of relate. And then as you were talking about different ways the women could connect, if they don't have certain practices, the mantra, I remember just seeing the mantra of White Tara on a tanka, and she came to me in a dream, you know? So all these things, and also dancing with women, you know, all kinds of things happen together when we, like, are dancing on this sacred stage for the first time in a hundred years there's something about female community in embodying and women used to dance the prayers for the community as you've taught us so through dreams mantra pictures reading about different deities you know enlightened female uh, beings um, helps us to connect to what's in us we are Tara, we're Kali. All these energies are within all women, all beings, actually. But when you're in a female form specifically, that triggers something. So that's my two cents worth. And yeah, thanks for bringing us back to where we were before. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So super rich conversation. I love it. Um, so anything else before we transition into mudras? <clears throat> this is super awesome. So your homework is at some point before the end of our time together. So I guess it's like a week and a half. Um, do some improv and exploration and report back. Yeah. I have one last question. Yeah. Um, so when you're starting to do this work, I'm wondering, because I'm feeling a very strong call personally to, to be like very single during this time and just not to have my energies mesh with other people. And I'm wondering, that's probably, you know, if you're a temple dancer, that's probably kind of what you did. Like you weren't necessarily, um, in a relationship or whatnot. So are we talking uh, sexual energy or just being around people in general? Sexual. Oh, yes. So the temple dancers, well, there's a couple things I'll say about that. One about temple dancer and one about yogini practice. Um, mm -hmm. So the temple dancers, and this is, you know, again, I'm talking, when I refer to temple dance, I mean like what it was originally set up and designed as. And so, yes, the dancers we're married to the deity. We're married to the God. And that was who their sexual energy exchange was with. It was not with the humans. Um, now, maybe in some circumstances there were. Um, so there's the 64 arts, um, like the 64 yoginis. Each yogini embodies the perfection of a certain art. And I'm sure in those arts, there are sexual arts so okay but generally speaking that sexual energy was was the dance that was like making love to the deity their husband that was their dance and the idea was is that the dancers were just imbibed with their shakti so like for me right now having been locked inside for months um, with my this on doing extensive practice, I am like so shocktified, so massively shocktified. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so that's temple dance. 
in regards to yogini practice, there's been sadhanas that I've done that uh, my teachers, both in the Buddhist and in, in the Indian, um, where they've said, you know, ideally and traditionally, this is just meant for you. You're not sharing that energy. And also that means not diluting the Shakti with any plant medicines, including tobacco, uh, caffeine, sugars, alcohol, anything that would dilute the intensity of the Shakti, anything that would separate you from the full experience of the Shakti you're cultivating, which means when we've got the lid on the pot and the fire's on high, meaning we're doing a really disciplined sadhana and we've got the pot is sealed with all of our Shakti adornments. It can be so intense where you're like, I want to go and make love or I want to have a glass of wine or I want to whatever. But it's like, no, get in the bathtub, go take a walk, like oil your feet, whatever you got to do to allow yourself to have the full experience and capacity of that Shakti. So just saying, um, yeah, I'm kind of just giving you different scenarios. Yeah. Okay. That's really helpful. Yeah. That, that, that was just like a little nudge, you know, the side eye, like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else before we move on to mudras? Okay. 